Hi, and welcome to a small, medium at large podcast. It's the next year now that we've been in shows here. We're uh, really excited to be back again. It's the beginning of a new year, 2023. So we're looking forward to having a really great year ahead. We have a whole, whole bunch of exciting guests lined up for you. Plus, we have a lot of guests that we have in the past. If you haven't seen our shows, check them out. You know, we're on Spotify, YouTube, all of the different podcast platforms. So let me tell you a little bit about today's guests. Today's guest. Today's guest is Mark Ireland. Mark Ireland is the co-founder of Helping Parents Heal, an organization that supports bereaved parents with over 25,000 members worldwide. Mark is the author of several books, including the groundbreaking Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go, a moving account of his personal quest for answers about life after death following the passing of his youngest son. He has also written Messages from the Afterlife and The Persistence of the Soul, which will be released this year in the fall. Mark is the son of renowned mid-20th century psychic Richard Ireland, whose clients were among the rich and famous, Mae West, Glenn Ford, and Mamie ha Eisenhower, to name a few. Mark published his father's book, Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development. Mark has participated in mediumship research studies conducted by the University of Arizona and the University of Virginia. He currently operates an independent medium certification program. Given his extensive exploration of mediumship and his collaboration with researchers in this field, Mark Ireland offers a unique perspective on compelling evidence for an afterlife. Let's welcome Mark here today. Hi, Mark. Hey, Gail. How are you? Good. It's a pleasure to have you here today as our first guest of 2023. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I want to say that I really appreciated reading your book, Soul Shift and finding where the dead go. I think it's an incredibly fabulous book and I couldn't put it down. I had things to do, so I had to go finish them. And then I went right back and I scooped up and read the entire book in a day and a half. And I absolutely loved every bit of it. But Thank before you. we talk about these things, I wanted to, like I do with all my guests, start from the beginning in your childhood. I have to say you might be up there in one of my most interesting guest childhoods here because you grew up with a prominent psychic medium for a father. So I was wondering if you could share what your childhood and being with a man like that in your family, what that was like for you growing up. For me, it was normal. It's just other kids probably wouldn't have perceived it that way because their parents weren't on top of everything going on all the time. Mm -hmm. um, he, My dad said that he tried to let us live normal lives and not intervene too much, but he did intervene some. Uh, I recall, I think in the book, I'd mentioned a couple stories. One was when my mother and my father were first married. She was trying to be a vegetarian. She'd gone several months without eating meat. But one day she got a hankering for a hamburger and she went out and got it. And uh, later that day, dad came home and the first words out of his mouth were, so surely did you enjoy your hamburger today? <laughs> uh, so, And my brother, who was 10 years older than me, you know, when I was, you know, maybe eight or seven or eight years old he was uh hot rodding racing his car and then he had somebody buy him beer when he was underage and my dad just always busted him for those kinds of things so it was interesting but I was also really proud of my dad and um I think the thing that stuck with me the most was one you know I had seen his psychic demonstration hundreds of times over the years but the thing that really stood out to me was when spirit would come through spontaneously at certain points during what was to be a psychic demonstration, he would like shift into another gear for pieces. And then he would get contact with someone who had passed and he was able to share names and specific information that really resonated with the people. So I always remembered that. And I think more than anything else, that gave me confidence from a young age that there's more than just physical existence. And the brain is not a generator of consciousness, but rather a, a sifter of it or a uh, transmitter uh, uh, that's not the term I'm thinking of but that that we are a soul and a body I guess is where I'm going with that but it was I, it was an interesting childhood to me it was normal 
I, um, I've also had that with my kids growing up with me and I've wondered what their view is when they'd come home and I'd say, oh, so you're with this guy and he was driving a Mustang and his mother was a this. And they all look at me and say, how did you know that? You know, or they come in and I'd say, you just ate mushrooms, didn't you? You know, <laughs> different <laughs> things that they would, they would not know how in the world I would know these things. And when I would say them about their friends also, the friends would get spooked. <laughs> And my children, my daughter always is a skeptic. She doesn't even believe in these psychic things. So I was curious how it was for you. I'm wondering what my children's view are when, they, when they've grown up with someone like where I say, oh, we're going to have an accident. We can't go this way. So they've seen these things through the years, but they've always just made fun of me. They've never like. <laughs> yeah, my dad, one time I recall he was, uh, and he, was, he had his own church. He was a minister. It was a non-denominational church, rather unconventional church, but he was going to church one Sunday and he knew in his mind that he, he would be in a wreck if he went the normal way so he took an alternate route he still got in the wreck I <laughs> that was the University of Life Church was that correct the, that uh, I thought that sounded very interesting and that, that brought me to another question which was I couldn't figure out when I was reading the book where he was getting his income to support all of you if it was he was highly paid enough in the in the psychic field or if it had something, I wasn't sure, how was he, was it being a minister? So early on, he initially um, became ordained through the National Association of Spiritualist Churches, the NASC. Um, so he was a traveling minister and he served in different churches. And then it was 1960, that he went out on his own because even that church, even though it's far more open-minded than most of the Christian denominations, he felt it was still too dogmatic and he wanted an environment where people could think and um, explore and figure things out for themselves. He would present things like his psychic demonstrations and the mediumship as evidence of some of the, the miracle stories in, that are in scripture, but he didn't try and ram things down people's throat. He wanted them to think for themselves. So it was maybe a little less dogmatic of an approach. Um, so uh, when he started the church, I'm sure he got some income from that. It wasn't a lot of money. I mean, because getting people to tithe or whatever, and you're not really pushing it too hard. Um, I think the church just barely got by probably over the years, but he was a big draw when he was there. Sometimes he would travel, but I think a lot of his income was supplemented. He would do other events initially, like for rotary clubs or hospital associations or whoever. And then eventually he did, you know, later on he did nightclubs and TV shows and stuff like that. And I think he just felt like, even though some of the people in the church frowned on him going into nightclubs and even Las Vegas, he felt like, look, there's people that will never set foot in a church. And if they don't see something like this, their minds will never be open to the possibility that they're more than they think they are. I, I, I wish, he, you know, I wish he was here today, even though I know he's still here in spirit, but I, 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 when I read the, could you please tell our audience about one of the things he used to do with the uh, dollar bill? Because I found that phenomenal because I know how hard that is to do that. Well, his his normal demonstration of psychic phenomena was to tape his eyes with 10 strips of Johnson Johnson medical tape, which is a very strong adhesive. Um, so it would seal up against the nose and now over the eyes and everything. Then he would put three opaque black blindfolds over that, one this way, one this way, and one this way, and then more tape over and then tape down underneath where his eyes are. So, so I mean, there's no way he could see. Uh, I know that. I know there are people, even Russell Targ, I think, as a kid, was an amateur ma a magician. Yes, he there, was. There are people who will use a blindfold and do something like this, but typically they won't have all that tape and things, and they'll use coins over their eyes and there's a technique where they'll bulge the coin up so they can look down. I don't know how they do that, but that's one of the magic techniques for doing this. Anyhow, my dad did it in a way that was much more convincing because he couldn't see, you know, it was that simple. And then uh, he would have people send up questions on what are called billets. Uh, they would write their name and then maybe their just their first name typically, and then a question they wanted answered. Uh, it could be about pertaining to something in the future or whatever. And they would send those up and he would get their paper. And when he touched it, he 
he would connect with them and usually give them more than was written on the paper. Other things they hadn't even asked. Um, and some people would send up bills like a you know dollar bill or twenty dollar bill, whatever. They would retain the serial number like on a piece of paper for themselves, send the bill up, and then ask my dad to give them the the uh, serial number on the bill. And uh, he would do that. I mean, virtually perfectly. I've only seen him miss it like one digit one or two times out of hundreds of times, and then he'd restate it and get it right. Um, now, there's a gentleman that used to, uh, he owned a, a place where my dad demonstrated. His name's Tony DePrima. He was an attorney. And he and his partners tried to trick my dad. On three occasions, they took a $20 bill, wrapped it in foil, put it in a sealed envelope, and asked for the serial number, and he still got it right. So they were pretty convinced. And I, I found an article. It was in the 1972 uh, Tuscaloosa Times, which is probably a very obscure paper, but they were they were interviewing Helmut Schmidt, who had worked at the Duke Parapsychology Lab, mm -hmm. and he did kind of his own uh, test on my dad. He had seen him in a public venue, and he walked to three different tables of people, and he asked each one to give him a number, and then he put the three numbers together, which were 385, and he, I guess, used a red pen. He put that in an envelope, sent it up, and wrote on the outside of the envelope, tell me what this says without opening the envelope, and my dad, he grabbed it, he goes, oh, you, you want to know that? That's just... 385 in red ink. And so uh, he was pretty blown away by that. And I, th I think that the gist of that article was that had um, had the parapsychology lab brought more people like my dad in instead of just the average Joe student, they might have had even better results than they ended up with. Although I know in the telepathy experiments, it's pretty compelling evidence that they did generate, especially the Pierce Pratt experiments. But Anyhow, that's that's the dollar bill thing. <laughs> well, that, you know, to me that it's hard to imagine the ability to be able to see that many numbers that, I mean, just to me, I was really blown away reading that because I, I may see one or two numbers of, of something, but to read the idea of being able to read a whole serial number, I think that's, I mean, I'm just thinking it's phenomenal. Yeah, he said it was like a dream that was so very real that it was real. and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, he called it x-ray clairvoyance. I guess today we call that remote viewing, but it was a extremely vivid remote viewing, apparently, for him to be able to do that and see that. Yes, I, I've been to the to the to Duke University. I gave a talk there for the Rhine research. Hmm. And they have a they keep a file on me of all my stories there. And nice. uh, my first guest on our podcast is Sally Rhinefeather. And yeah, I've met her once. Yes, back in, I think it was at Bill Roll's memorial. Oh, um, I met him also. The man on ghosts, wasn't he? Yeah. The man about ghosts. I think so. Yeah, I, I don't know him that well. I know he was a pretty well-regarded uh, researcher of parapsychology, and uh, Eben Alexander was there at the same time. So that's where I, I've met Eben a couple times. But that's when I met him. And I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a neuroscientist. What was his name? Who was Eben it? Alexander? Was a neuroscientist, a neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience and then wrote a book about it afterward. And it's it's a pretty compelling case for the reality of, of what he experienced at, you know, at a time when his brain was essentially non-functioning. Do you, do you think that right now in 2023, there's more um, research and attention and information being given out to the mainstream media than ever before on the proof? I mean, there was just the... The Bigelow, uh, you know, about the Bigelow contest. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, my friend Jeffrey Mishlove won the half million dollar uh, prize. That this, this, you know, this is this, this, there's people supporting the work of this, but it seems to me that it seems more upfront now than ever before. And I was wondering if you think that also. I agree. I think academia is still stuck in the past and attached to materialism as a philosophy. Um, I don't know when that's going to be broken, but my my feeling about it is it's going to be a grassroots movement. It's the average person. It's the multitudes that know these things are real. They've experienced them or they have someone in their family who does it, um, and they're not going to take that anymore. Uh, and they pay the tax bills that fund these academic institutions. So, And, and the other thing is the government's been fiddling around with remote viewing, which is a psychic phenomena, phenomenon for, for years. 
yet downplaying it. So on one hand, you know, they obviously believe in it or they wouldn't be have used remote viewing to try and spy on Russians on Russia and and what they're doing. And they um, spent 20 allow, million. Yeah, or million well, simultaneously million. allowing this to be viewed as, you know, oh, it's not real and that kind of a thing. So I think there is more interest. There are people like with the Bigelow money stepping up, but I there's still just a handful of people really researching this, like Dean Radin, um, like the, the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, um, the people over there, Jim Tucker and others. Um, I just think, and Dr. Emily Williams Kelly, um, I met her and talked to her and was involved in an experiment she ran. But there's just very few. And I think the thing is, there's still a fear factor where if you got a lot of these folks out of academia and pulled them to the side, they would honestly tell you, yeah, they think there's something going on or they believe in more than what they can state, but they're worried about their careers. And, you know, so they, they can't really say what they think or, or go into those areas of study. Hopefully that will be changing, you know, just because of the groundswell of interest. Yeah. Dean had mentioned once to me about for him to get something in a peer respected journal, how much um, scrutiny and how many double blind tests have to be done before it can be presented to a scientific paper. And he compared it to, I can't remember, I'm not good at the memory of the numbers, but the amount that you have to do for a medical drug was like a 10th of what you have to do to to, 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 to prove anything scientifically. But if it was psychic, then it had to have you know, so much scrutiny, but if it was a new drug, it didn't seem to have to have as many. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's interesting too, because it's like, um, I, I guess it's viewed as like non-falsifiable or something. Uh, you, the phenomena, they're looking for a material expl materialistic explanation, a, a mechanistic mystery. explanation. And without that, they won't ever accept it. And and you're never going to get one, in my opinion, because it's it's consciousness that's primary and it's part of that. It's not some mechanical or mechanistic thing, <laughs> you know, a process, I don't think, anyhow. I call it the invisible and the mystery and that it's never meant to be solved or proved or shown. It's just, it just is. Yeah. And, um, but I'm always happy to participate in any experiments that may help them in any way. Um, I, you know, I'm always approaching it more from a spiritual place, not really as, as much a scientific place. So I'm wondering if we could go on here about your engagement with mediums and researchers in this field, like some of the stories you had about finding out about the, the experiences of the loss of your son, you had some really amazing mediums that you met with. I think one of them was uh, Alison Dubois from that show that Medium was made about, which I love that show. Um, and I'm wondering what that was like for you discovering, you didn't have your dad to go to for right. this. So you had to reach out to other people. And I think you were guided to not necessarily because I think there's a lot of charlatans out there sure and finding good people is really an, you know a great thing and I was wondering if you could share this with some people because some people don't know the difference between what is an actual good medium and what is somebody who's really just making things up yeah and that kind of rolls into the medium certification program I started that I told you about that you'd mentioned earlier we could touch on that later but um going back to after my son's passing you're right my dad was no longer here on the earth. I did have an uncle with similar abilities who I was able to consult. He passed another 10 months after that. But for that 10 month period, he was almost like a surrogate father to me. Mm -hmm. And I went to him early on. And uh, my son, Brandon had passed while hiking on in the McDowell Mountains in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we didn't know the cause of death. Um, I talked to my uncle right afterward. And he said, can I do anything for you? I said, well, if you can get some sort of message or whatever, I'd really appreciate it. And it was a couple of days later, I was in the, in the uh, mortuary and making arrangements and we connected by cell phone. And he said, Mark, you know, last night I tried to connect. I couldn't get anything, but this morning I was doing my morning meditation and your father came to me and he wanted to let you know that, that he was there for Brandon when Brandon crossed over 
and he was Brandon was a little confused about what was going on, but he helped him adjust. And then he told me the cause of death before um, the autopsy. He had said Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen in his bloodstream that caused his heart to fail. And two days later, the physician who performed the autopsy uh, called me and said that he had Brandon had suffered a severe asthma attack that drove his blood oxygen level down to cause cardiac arrest. So my uncle told me that before they even had done you know, the, the research. So then I was kind of, this is kind of opening me back up to my father's field, which I hadn't really been engaged in for a long, long time. I always respected it and, and found comfort in it, but now I, I needed it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd had some of my own psychic experiences, as you would think it's kind of a genetically passed along thing from what most researchers say. And I found that to be true. I just, I'm not my father, you know, and I haven't really sought to develop it like that. But I initially was interested in getting a reading um, and I think it was, so Brandon passed in January and February of the same year, there was a, I was watching the evening news on the NBC affiliate in Phoenix, and they were showing a research uh, initiative conducted by Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona. And in that particular instance, it showed the medium, Alison Dubois, and it showed some, how it worked. And it was a single blind test. So she couldn't see the sitters and the sitters weren't able to talk to her until the end, you know, after it was over. And some of the things she said were very specific pertaining to the deceased person. So I was really impressed with what I saw. And, um, you know, the things that she said turned out to be accurate. And they weren't just, you know, willy-nilly things. They were specific and things that were meaningful to the sitters. Well, the, so I thought to myself, geez, I'd love to get a reading from her. And I'd love to be a sitter in that lab. The very next day, I received a call from a man named Jerry Concer, who was a friend of my father's. And Jerry says, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through, and I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name is Allison Dubois, and here's <laughs> a phone number you can call to get an appointment. So right then, I figured, okay, my dad's in, involved in helping me out here. Yep. And I had to wait a while, because even before the show Medium came out, she was already very popular, because uh, she's very good. Um, now, what, <laughs> this is kind of funny, but um, I think it was two weeks before my reading with her, someone had given me um, a manuscript. It was basically typewritten pages in a box. And it, it said, Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by Richard Ireland. I said, well, where'd you get this? And he said, well, your dad gave it to me before he passed because you were out of state at the, at the time. I said, well, you've had it for 12 years. Why are you giving it to me now? He goes, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to. So two weeks later, I have the reading with Alison Dubois. And she says, I feel your father's here and he's showing me a book. I feel it's his book, but he's handing it to you to take forward. Do you know what this means? And so I knew exactly what it meant. But that was uh, an example of one of the things that happened, you know, um, in the readings. But I met with, in Soul Shift, I initially met with four mediums, uh, you know, Alison Dubois, um, Linda Williamson in England, who's very, very good. She's now retired, but she's well known for, uh, providing a secret code to medium John Edward after his mother died. So John Edward um, is a psychic medium on the East Coast, real well known here in the States. He and his mother had agreed on a secret code and then the mother died. So he went to two mediums before Linda and then he went to Linda. And during that reading, she says, um, well, your mother's here and she says that she's the guiding light in your life. He says, that's it. It's the guiding light. She was a soap opera fan and the guiding light was her favorite show. Oh. So, but Linda was wonderful. I also met with Jamie Clark in Phoenix, who's become since become a good friend. And then finally, uh, Lori Campbell, who at that time was working with Schwartz in his lab. Um, she was outstanding. They were all very, very good. But that was actually a, a done as a single blind test. And there's a clip on Discovery Channel um, of that if people want to go to my website and see it it's only like two and a half minutes long um, and your website it's mark ireland author.com mark with a k ireland like country author mark ireland author.com so, so um yeah all of those were compelling it was interesting too the overlap between them and the co the consistency of information provided uh, between the four and so, you know, that's what was in that book. And then I, at the end, I kind of summarized my conclusion, my, what I felt happened and both intuitively and analytically, you know, cause I'm kind of a blend of those two left and right brain. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, 
there's I've had a lot more experiences after that. Um, and those are some of those are documented in my uh, will be uh, documented in my upcoming book, The Persistence of the Soul, plus a lot more. That's a more scholarly book that's going to be coming out. It's not a dry read, but it does have, you know, a lot of the research um, that's been done over the years and personal experiences, it's kind of a blend of two things, you know, um, my own experiences, what my findings are, the things that I've uh, seen and and accounts, but also uh, scientific evidence. And then I have a whole chapter uh, uh, devoted to skepticism, you know, true skeptic, open-minded skepticism versus the debunker type skepticism. Another chapter on um, religion uh, in history and these type of phenomena and how they're viewed in, through the various lenses of different religions. Some people have hangups about that. So I, I address that. It probably focuses more on the Christianity because in the country we live in, it's pr predominant. But I also touch on other faiths, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Islam, and um, uh, what am I forgetting here? <laughs> Judaism. Um, so anyhow, um, but I've had a lot more experiences though for those four, but those were kind of my first four um, that brought me back in, into this field and really helped me kind of get over the hump and my family and friends to really be comforted uh, after the passing of Brandon. That, that, so when you, <clears throat> for any of our listeners out there who have lost someone, when you've met with, and we've all lost someone, when you've met with these uh, very qualified and professional mediums, afterwards, it gave you some sense of relief and feeling of connection to the spirit of your son, is that right? Yeah. And, it, you know, it's not even that I needed proof because I already felt like I, I knew internally from even back to childhood that there's more than this. But that sense of connection was wonderful and very healing. And, uh, you know, the parents group that I co-founded, Helping Parents Heal, we, you brought that up earlier. The, you know, the one difference between us and all of the other bereaved parent organizations is we allow the open discussion of spiritual experiences and, and afterlife evidence. And that it makes a huge difference because some of the folks that I've talked to who have been in these other groups, they're just about like getting it off their chest about the suffering and the pain, but really no, there's no hope element there, you know, um, and it makes a big difference. You know, we had a conference with 900 people in Phoenix last August, and I couldn't believe how uplifting the whole thing was. It was just unbelievable for 900 people who had suffered uh, the passing of a child or more than one child to be happy and joyous. The people at the hotel were afraid coming into that, that it was gonna be a real downer. And they said, we were the best group that they've ever had. And while I was there, at least half a dozen people came up to me and said, thank you, you saved my life. And that means different things to different people. Some had been suicidal, you know, and others, maybe they just meant it gave them a chance to really live again and to, to move forward. So I think that hope element is, is a big deal in people's healing. You know, I think that that there's there's all the different stages of the of the grieving, and they do need all those parts to express the feelings to get through that. But then, if you give them the next stage, which is the hope and the future of what that we aren't just our body, then yeah. it's a whole nother level that uh, is really needed. Because, yeah. but they have to first get through their grieving part to then be open, I think, to the next process. Yeah, you're right. You, you, you can't circumvent that process. I went through it. I mean, I, I remember the agony I was in for the first two weeks. You know, just I'd lay in the bed and just feel numb, go visit with people for a minute and then go lay down again. And just, I could get no peace, no comfort um, for, for that. You, ha you have to go through that part. It, part it's physiological in part. Um, but I think the thing is, what I'm talking about are people who are in the same place they were 10 years ago. And that's that's really sad to see. Um, and that's what we typically don't have in our group because you know we allow that hope element to be discussed and not quashed or, or shut down when people bring it, those things up. So this is wonderful work that you're doing because you're reaching people through your books and then through uh, podcasts, and then through this organization. 
So really, Brandon has fueled you with so much to do that you you have to be incredibly busy now. <laughs> It is interesting. And I still work a full-time job in the corporate world too. <laughs> and, oh no. And what? I I I play music. I write songs and I play guitar and I just did an album. Um and I I just put that out. It's on Spotify and, and Amazon and YouTube and all that stuff too. So I, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. Wait, so because when I was looking through the uh online for just information about you. I saw this Mark Island music and all this, and I said, oh, that can't be him. Yeah. <laughs> so that's you also. Yeah, and one of the songs that I wrote that I'm really pleased with, it's called What You Can't See, and it's a spiritual song. It's really about this whole idea. Um, that, I'm just trying to think if people want to look it up. You could just type, just Google the Mark Ireland experiment. That's the name of what I've dubbed my own band, because it's really... It's kind of like how Steely Dan worked for the Alan Parsons project. It's just me and then whoever else I bring in to play the other instruments and sing and stuff like that. But that particular song, What You Can't See, I think people would like it. It's on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube or Spotify. Um, but it, it really, it's kind of everything that we're talking about now with music, you know, to because a lot of people, younger people, they don't read books anymore. So you have to find another wow. avenue. Right. That's that's a wonderful, you know, in doing this podcast, I'm new at this and it's only been like a year and a half that I've been doing this. But in that time, I've had friends who I just recently have, I've had some friends who've lost a child and to be able to say to them, oh, I just want you to go. There's a podcast. If you if you want to listen to it, here's a book by the woman that I had. She be, She was a federal judge. And she left her judge work and her, and her law practice after 30 years after the loss of her son from a drug overdose and changed her entire life and became a shaman and now does all spiritual work. So she went from this legal, being a federal judge, completely 360 degree turnaround to a whole nother path all over this discovering what the grief and the loss and what you had to do to grow through that. So I always feel so great when I know that there's some people that I can refer or people I've known who've had this trauma that, hey, I can and can now tell my friend Scotty about your organization after we finish our show later so that he should go and check out something like this because he has lost his son only a couple months ago. And then I, I'm just saying that all of us know somebody who's had this kind of a loss and sometimes we really don't know how to reach out and help because we haven't experienced that loss that way. But when we can connect them to other people who have had that, they really have a heart to heart connection on help in that area. So it's great work. I'm, I'm sure your father is proud as he's watching you do all this. Well, it's funny. That's exactly what James Van Prague said last night because we had him on a Zoom meeting for Helping Parents Heal. And I got a reading, which I didn't expect because we had hundreds of people on there. Um, but there was a, a lot of information he shared that was pretty pertinent and uh, on target. It was not publicly known stuff, but he said, your dad and your son are very proud of you. So, I, you know, it's it's interesting. I, uh, well, I definitely did not want to lose my son or have him pass. You know, I probably never would have done any of this otherwise. And, and I couldn't have related to people in the same way. It's a pretty high price to pay to be able to serve. But, you know, once you're in that situation, um, I think it's, it helps you heal too when you help others. I have a friend who, very dear friend I've known since kindergarten, and you know we're in our late sixties now, and we've been close all the years. And she lost her daughter to suicide at the same age as your son, eighteen, and then her husband four years later to suicide. Oh. And she and him would spend those four years where they would go and comfort other people when they'd lose their child and needed help right away. They would go around and help and sit and be with the people. So they devoted their time besides their regular working job to helping other people who would lose a child or a member of the family to suicide. <clears throat> and I don't know if they worked through an organization or what they did, but the fact is that that was very healing for them to be able to go and help other people who had the same experience. And she's a strong, my friend is a strong, amazing woman to be able to have dealt with those two losses and be able to function and 
we did a cleansing in her house that I did a shamanic cleansing, but I was here because it was COVID and she was there in uh, Pennsylvania. And we went through the whole house and smudged every window. And I, I, I did this all with her through, a, you know, FaceTime or whatever this was. And I had powerful images come up of what she had living in that house having lost both of her family members in that house. And she did a phenomenal job and we did an amazing cleansing. And then she walked out the door and the new people moved in and the house was like, they felt like nothing but joy and she shared only the joy with them. Mm. So I, I, my, I, I, my hat is off to the, all of you people who can deal with such trauma in such an amazing way and turn it around to be healing, which brought me to a quote you had in your book I just wanted to share. And I believe this was you, not your father's quote. Like the shaman who turns his wound into a healing skill. I thought that was a beautiful line. Was that you or your dad who had said that? That was not my dad. It was me, but it was actually with a little nudge from my publisher, uh, Richard Grossinger. Who I also know, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, well, I thought that was just, I just love that quote. And I feel like it just spoke to me so, because I feel that's exactly the things for me in the compassions and the things that we bring with us all come from the challenges and pains and things that we had to endure to get us to those different places. So if we don't judge them as this horrible thing happened, but just this transformational thing happened. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a less blaming approach. Or <laughs> well, so much of life is really, it's cliche, but it's how you view things, you know, and how you internalize things. I've always typically been a positive person, glass half full. And for the most part, things have gone well for me and I've been happy. And I know people who are the other way, they're more pessimistic, always expecting the worst. And usually they get it, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like you, you kind of create your own reality in a way. Yes, it's I think it's I think that there is that that's but sometimes we need help along the way to get out of that place yeah. to be able to, to move on. So I'm going to go down to another question here, which is, can you tell us what this um this experience is where you have um, done working and testing with mediums under these controlled conditions. Is that what you're doing now when you have this, um, uh, I don't know if it's a course or the certification program. Can you tell us what that's actually, like if somebody was interested in joining the certification mediumship program, what would you tell them now? Okay, well, let me first start with the, how it started and why it started. And that goes back to when my first book, Soul Shift, came out. After that, I had a lot of people coming to me saying, hey, can you recommend a good medium? And at that time, I knew a handful of really good ones, but most of them were very famous. So they, a lot of them charged a lot. Um, it was their sole source of income. And they had long wait lists. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then when Helping Parents Heal started, <clears throat> I had even more people ask me for recommendations. And I realized, you know, they, I need more options for people. And I figured there got to be some gifted people out there that are just unknown or not well known who don't have long wait lists and charge less. You know, maybe it's because they're just starting out or they've just never really been out there with their, their abilities. So I thought, well, why don't I find these people who have the ability that aren't known and I'll put a website together and then, and I've done all this out of my own pocket. I have an assistant who's a volunteer who helps schedule the readings and stuff. And then I put together testing protocols, uh, mainly with my friend, Trisha Robertson, who's with the Scottish Society of Psychical Research. Mm -hmm. She's done a lot of experiments herself uh, with uh, Professor Archie Roy in Scotland in the past, who is a really prominent um, scientist. He's since passed, but uh, so she was helpful to me. I also... Uh, learned a little bit about the protocols Dr. Emily Williams Kelly was using in her tests for mediumship with the University of Virginia. So I kind of compiled those and put together a program uh, for how I do it. And really what it boils down to is if a medium wants to become certified, 
they have to go through five blind readings with someone they don't know via Zoom. So the sitter has to change their name on the on the uh, on the screen, so it would only show their first name, not their last, and they're not allowed to use video, at least in the beginning. So the the two of them would get on to the Zoom call, and um, they would say hello to each other, and then the medium would start doing the reading. The at a certain point, maybe ten minutes in, after the medium shares whatever they get, the uh, sitter can then ask to connect with a person just a first name only. And then, so we, the, the whole reading is recorded. And then at the end, the sitter is responsible for transcribing it and then scoring each remark. Now I've actually just adjusted the scoring methodology. Um, I keep refining it over time to make it actually a little tougher, uh, but to make sure it accurately reflects the quality of the reading. Um, there's no perfect way to do it because some of it's subjective too on the part of the sitter. But basically they have to grade they have to take all the things that are said and break them into individual statements. Like for example, if the medium said, I have a young man here, I think he's your son. Uh, he was a big fan of pepperoni pizza. Uh, he, I think he liked uh, Nike tennis shoes. So, you know, then the sitter when they transcribe would say, um, did son here, did son pass, uh, pepperoni pizza, you know? So then they would grade it correct, incorrect or correct plus a bonus. And now I used to just have one bonus, but I have two levels of bonus, a two point bonus and a five point. So a two point would be, for example, if the media, if let's just say the deceased person's first name is, is Kevin. If the medium says, I have the initial K, you maybe give a bonus two for that. But if the medium says it's Kevin, you give five point bonus for that. So that's kind of, that's where it gets subjective. But otherwise, it's correct, incorrect, or indeterminable. Now, indeterminable is like a prediction of something that hasn't happened yet or something there's no way that the person could find out if it's accurate or not. Those kind of get pushed to the side. But I don't allow them to have more than 33% of those statements because then it's just not ac it's not sufficiently accurate. You're going to have some indeterminable statements. But mm -hmm. if they go over 33%, then those start to count against them. So that's the bottom line. I, I statistically put this together. Um, a passing score now is 75, which is basically the percent of accuracy plus bonus points. So you could, you have to be, now I've just raised it, you have to be at least 65% accurate with the indeterminate statement set aside. And then you'd have to have a total score of at least 75. So that would mean you'd either have to be 65% accurate plus have two of the big bonus points to pass. Um, and I've had mediums score in the 90s. I've had some just eat by too. In fact, I've raised the standards. It used to be a little bit lower. But does that act, does that adequately kind of explain it? Mm -hmm. So it's done through Zoom. Uh, they get tested by uh, doing a reading with five uh, different times, five different people. Right. And the judging sound, it's similar, like, when I do remote viewing uh, with Russell and he we he judges it at the end, each score from a zero to seven as as is there more words that are inaccurate? It's one score. If more words are accurate, if the drawing is more, you know, so it does it's judged similarly that way by how much is correct, how much is incorrect. There's an amount of difference between the two. Yeah. Now, yeah. so. When they, so then they're not actually going through a training to get the certification. They're just showing their abilities. Correct. Tested to see if they're consistent and if they're very accurate as the difference between, say, a K or a Kevin. The Kevin is obviously much more on target if that's the person's name. The K is close to it, but they yeah. just don't have the rest of it. Or the pepperoni pizza thing. What if, what if that turned out to be the kid's favorite food is pepperoni pizza? then that's subjective to the sitter. Like, I'll give that a five, you know? But right. if it's like, well, he liked pepperoni pizza. It was one of his five favorite foods. Maybe you give it the bonus too, you know? Or maybe you just say it's correct. The correct is just, you know, right. goes into the statistical measurement. But it's so, really up to the sitter to decide whether it's just a grade is correct. Like, okay, they would say um, he was... Um, a young man. Well, that's kind of general, but yeah, he was a young man. Okay, correct. Um, but if you said he was 28 years old, 
you know, it's like, that's correct, but that probably deserves a bonus because that's exactly how old he was or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a subjective thing. The sitter decides whether they want to award the bonus points or not. But we will scrutinize that too, because sometimes we'll find sitters can be too generous. Um, and then we'll like go back to them and say, hey, does this really warrant these bonus points? Why did you assign those bonus points? So, you know, again, really what it was done, I'm trying to get a list of people who already practice mediumship that are good and 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 can more times than not provide a good reading for people who need it that are in a state of grief um, and that they're typically affordable and they don't have long waits. Now, some of them become more prominent since I've tested them. So their rates have gone up and their availability is less. But I've got, I think, over 30 people now certified since I started this in 2014. So there's there's a lot of options. I now So now this is something that I've always... This isn't a judgment. I'm just, this is really, I just want your feedback or question on how I feel about this. My dad always told me uh, since I exhibited certain gifts as a child that I was to never ever sell those for any exchange of monies. And um, I never have. And so I've had people even on my podcast can, can contact me through emails would I give them a reading? How much would I charge? Could I, you know, and what I do is send them off to someone I know that I think is a reputable person because I've never felt right that I should ever do that. And I don't know, I'm not saying that's not right for other people, but for me, it's always felt like these were gifts from whether you want to call it God or the universe, or I don't have a word from them, but I know it's higher consciousness. I know it's not me that's doing the, the the work the information is coming through me and I'm sort of like a vessel to to give it forth to the person but I've never felt like I don't mind if somebody comes and they give me a little bag or something that they made when they came or something like this but I've never felt right about the money part and I realize everyone needs to make a living so I just wasn't I've never been able to resolve that I think it's interesting in in the UK they com it's common for them not to charge. Like Gordon Smith is probably one of the top couple mediums in the world today. And he does not charge, but he doesn't do a lot of individual readings anymore because he's too famous. He'd be steamrolled <laughs> with demand. But, um, and his mentor was Albert Best, I guess, who was a really phenomenal psychic medium, sounded a lot like my dad from what he described. And he was a postman. So he made his money, you know, delivering mail. And then he yeah. just did that. And most of them were through the spiritualist church. That was kind of their framework um, or were their platform, I guess I would say. The, you know, in the States, it's a little different. Most of the mediums charge, I, you know, uh, there's a wide range of what they charge. And I think it probably depends on their financial situation. But, you know, it's not for me to judge. I'm just trying to provide a resource for people. And there's a full range of prices from very low to higher. But I think in general, the people that do it, that have real ability, they they quit a job so that they could do it full time. Um, so they they felt they had to charge to make their living to offset what they gave up by leaving a corporate job. Um, you know, I know one who's really phenomenal is Suzanne Wilson. She's in Cave Creek, Arizona, or Carefree, Arizona, which is north of Scottsdale. She, and she used to be uh, work for I think one of the some fashion company or a retail chain at their headquarters. And I think she was an HR associate, but for her to do this full time, she had to offset the income. And part of that was by charging for readings, doing workshops, other kinds of things like that. So I think that's where they're coming from. I, I don't really assign a judgment to it. If, if I ever work to develop my own, I don't know that I would really want to charge because I've done well in the business world and I'm not in the same position they are where I necessarily have right. to. But maybe if people wanted to, offer something as a gift, you know, I'd probably take it. You know, mm -hmm. It's hard for me to say, but mm -hmm. that's kind of where I'm coming from on it. It's, I, I just try and find the right resources for people and then share those on a website. I think that's amazing. And also that I don't know anybody who's done some thought of even doing something like that to be able to provide a service at an affordable rate with a qualified person. And I know that there are many people that are, you know, you know, grieving or in need of connecting to a medium and that the cost of some of these things prohibits them from from doing that 
and you providing a, a way where they could get in touch with people, plus that you've, you've screened them to make sure that they really are accurate people. They're not people that are doing any charlatan work. You're doing the the resume. I mean, you're making sure that they've got good good people. I think that's a great thing. And yeah, if also, they were charlatans, they'd never get through the five test readings successfully. Right. I wondered that about John Edwards. He comes up to where we live every year uh, uh -huh. at the Luther Burbank Center. I've never gone to see him, but I always wondered when I watched it, like, how could he be getting this information? I mean, is this really all real that he's getting this much information? I didn't know that it was possible that you could do that kind of work with a large audience like that and be that accurate. And so it, it made me always wonder whether that was really real. I had no idea about him. I don't know John Edward. I know of him. I've seen him on TV. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, I know a lot of mediums who do those gallery type events. And at our Health and Parents Seal conference, we had Gordon Smith there. And he did live readings for a crowd of, we had 900 people there, but I don't think all 900 were in that room, but we had at least 500 in that room when he was doing it. And he was phenomenal. And he ended up giving information to people that we we knew or talked to later that was dead on. I mean, so he could dial into certain people that were in the room and their deceased loved ones and, and do that. So I think it's probably a lot easier if you're just doing a one-on-one -on -one reading with somebody. But, you know, I don't know if he just trained himself to where he could do that. You know, me getting up there, I introduced him, but it's, I'm almost nervous talking to 500 people, you know, to introduce <laughs> him, let alone to try and do that. But, um, you know, he, it, it can be done. Um, I've seen it done successfully. Your dad, your dad yeah. was phenomenal with this, that to be able to say a person's name in an audience that, oh, is so-and-so here? And they jump up and he tells them about them. I mean, that's amazing. It's not even like they sought him out to speak to him. He's contacting them right from the stage. I, I'm i just very impressed. I, yeah, I, I had a woman reach out to me. I've had a lot of people write me through email over the years with different stories about their interactions with my dad that are pretty mind blowing. I think my favorite one came from a woman named Norma Poling. And she told me that she first saw my dad at a hospital auxiliary function where my dad did a psychic demonstration for a group of people and he had, you know, blindfolded himself and asked everyone to write a question. So she was trying to think in her mind, well, what question should I ask? And she narrowed it down to two questions, either, will I have a fourth child or will I get my master's degree? So she only wrote, will I get my master's degree? So she sends the paper up and my dad at the very end answers her and says, yes, you'll get your master's degree. So that she didn't see my dad for five years. She moved out of state. She came back, saw my dad five years later. And the next time she wrote an entirely new question. And so my dad gets her paper and he touches it and he says, oh, Norma, Norma Poling. I see you <laughs> well, 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 you haven't heard the punchline yet. He says, I see you've had that fourth child. Oh my God. That's only something she thought of five years earlier and never wrote. What does that tell you about time or what we think of as time? You know, oh, I, I, I've, you know, I've been doing remote viewing for over 20 years now with Dean Radin and Russell Targ. And it was where I, my experience there was, I was learning there from doing these, it wasn't just remote viewing. I did many different types of experiments in the paranormal research and it just, showed or proved to me because when I do these experiments I'm the subject I want to give them whatever it is they need I do this I don't get paid to do this it's you know volunteer I want it to be good but I learned something every time from my own self through that and what I learned was that time and space are not at all what we think and no. that there there is because how could I be remote viewing into the future and drawing what they're going to pick out of 300 pictures two hours in the future. It hasn't even been picked yet by anyone. And a machine is picking it, and I'm drawing the picture. So how could I see? So that was where I started to learn that there was no, there was no time. It isn't really two hours later. I'm looking at the picture like it's right now. It's not yeah. in two hours. Past, present, and future all happening at the same time. Exactly. Simultaneously, and I guess. I was very grateful to learn that information from them. You know, also from doing these experiments, I've learned things I didn't know that I 
could do because I'd never asked myself to look for a missing person or, you know, so this meeting all the people in this field has opened up lots of other interesting things for me to experiment or learn about. Uh, that there's, it doesn't matter how old you are, there are always still more new things to add and learn about in the way you function or do psychic work or remote viewing or whatever this is. I, I think that's great. Have you ever worked with Zener cards? Yes, I have. I, I was at the museum at the Rhine Research and they had the original Zeno cards and the mm -hmm. original dice and all these things in like a little museum. And I went and went to touch the dice because I wanted to touch them and I went and oh but they were so old that they kind of crumbled and powdered and I felt so bad <laughs> I didn't well, the reason... damage a piece of history jeez <laughs> should have been arrested <laughs> yeah, but the, they discovered when I talked to the um to Russell and Dean about this and I think it was Russell about the Xeno cards he said that they found that it, it's really that that it becomes too boring that it's not stimulating enough. And that's why they didn't they didn't continue to use, I don't mean the Rhine, but for remote viewing, they didn't, they continued not to not to necessarily use those kind of uh cards because it seemed to, they needed to have more stimulating, I think, images. Well, the reason I asked you is because I have another interesting story pertaining to Zener cards. Yes. So you earlier you'd mentioned, and I told them talked about my dad's book, Your Psychic Potential. Well, that book was really compiled because he was doing ESP workshops for people in the late 1960s and early 70s, teaching them how to develop. And that book is basically a compilation of what was in those workshops. Well, he was doing a workshop one day and he had two different sessions, a morning and an afternoon session. And so the person who was helping him was a man named Lynn Martin. And Lynn was like an associate minister at my dad's church back in the day. Uh, Lynn's still with us too. He's, I think he's just turned 80 but uh, still sharp as a tack, um, kind of like Stanley, right? Yes. Um, anyhow, uh, Lynn said that between the two sessions, they were sitting around and my dad said, hey, uh, Lynn, shuffle that card of Zener decks. So he's shuffling. He goes, shuffle it really, really good. Make sure you're totally satisfied with how it shuffled. While, he, while Lynn is shuffling the deck, my dad takes a piece of paper and writes one through 25, because I think it's a deck of 25. Mm -hmm. And next to each number, he starts drawing cross circle wavy line or whatever for all 25 and then he says okay Lynn are you done shuffling and Lynn says yeah I'm done he goes okay start turning them over Lynn turns them over and they're matching exactly what my dad had already written down 23 of the 25 were correct the only two that were wrong were inverted when I hear this I feel like I've done nothing <laughs> oh. well that was the that was the thing that stories, but that's a that's an incredibly I wanted before I forget there was a Stanley question I wanted to ask you and for our listeners the reason I have Mark here as a guest is because my dear friend Stanley Krippner recommended him and I I can't thank him enough he sends me so many wonderful guests well Stanley and I Stanley invited me to be with him this is a medium question and he invited me to be uh, participating in a table tipping group and we would meet down, Stanley lives about 45 minutes from me, and we would meet in, um, uh, was Mill Valley, somewhere around Mill Valley, we would meet, you know, or San Rafael, at this very nice man's house, and there was about six of us, and we were doing table tipping. But I thought table tipping was maybe one of these, you know, fake things that came out through the years or whatever, and right. I read some of the stuff about the 1860s and all this. Right. So I went there feeling that if Stanley asks me, I'm going to come and try it. But sure. the other part of me was like, but I don't know that that's really a real thing. Well, not only did I discover what a real thing it is, I found that what it seems like to me, and this is my question to you, if any of your mediums have done this, is that the spirit is speaking through the table to the persons. And that's what is making the reactions. And I'm not sure we would have these, like, while we would do it, we would see images that three people in the invisible would describe the exact same thing that is in invisible. And we go, did you see the man with the blue suit and the black hat? You know, and we would have all seen the same thing. Or 
there would be moments where when you said certain things, it would make the table react when you'd say, well, are you are you feeling this or is there a, and the table would respond and the table got to the point, you know, we had to build up like a relationship so that the six of us in the beginning, it took a long time for the table to have any response. Then after we'd met for, you know, like the third visit, the table starts rocking. By the time we had our seventh or whatever number of times we got together, the table was going around the room and you couldn't keep your hands connected from your seat to the table because it was going too far away. And one time I was afraid the table was going to hurt Stanley because it started going, you know, like that way and that way back and forth. And, you know, he's, you know, delicate. <laughs> and spirits would sort of appear. It was not the direction of what the person who wanted to do this was about. He was just directly relating to the table and that the table needed to levitate. I think maybe through our energetic field or something, but that's not what I experienced. I experienced spirits coming all the time and interacting with us while this would go on. And if the if we would be the most like laughing and joyous and happy, that's when we'd get the most reaction from the table. If we sat there seriously quiet, like touching our fingers, waiting, breathing deeply, nothing would happen. It turned out when we relaxed and just enjoyed ourselves, that's when activity happened. Do you find that there is that, do you think that's part of mediumship or do you think, have you spoken to people who've had that where the spirits, you know, a lot of interesting spirit things happen during those table tippings. Most of the mediums that I know are mental mediums and they've not really done much with physical phenomena like that. But I think there are cases where that can happen. I do think when you bring a group of people together and you have that positive, joyful atmosphere, it brings a certain energy together that um, that makes it much more viable to have those kind of phenomena happen. That's my opinion. Um, I'll give you even a, this is not exactly the same kind of thing, but I have spoken for a few years, once a year at a, a, a spiritualist church in San Francisco called the Golden Gate Spiritualist Church. And one particular time I was going with my friend, Tina Powers, who's a medium out of Tucson, who's really good. So I would go do a talk and then she would do, uh, she would do readings for the people in the congregation. And this one particular time, I think it was 2015, she says, Mark, um, I think you're going to get a message. Will you share it with the people if you do? And I said, sure, you know, um, and she just kept hounding me about this over and over. Mark, do you promise me that you'll share whatever you get? I said, sure, I will. I promise even down to the day that we got to the church, we're walking in the door. She goes, Mark, will you share a message if you get it? I'm like, yes, Tina. <laughs> well, this particular church had been founded in 1924 by a, a woman named Florence Becker, who by all accounts was very similar to my father in her abilities. Uh, she had passed, I think in 1970 or thereabouts, um, but the church was still going on. So anyhow, we go into the church on this day I go into their healing room and people are getting hands-on healing or laying them on of hands healing. So I sit on the bench of either a piano or organ and I just try to quiet my mind and prepare to talk. So I was kind of in a meditative state and usually I have a lot of stuff going on so it's hard to quiet my mind. But in this case, it went blank. It was just remarkable. And then while I was sitting there, I had a name pop into my head. I didn't hear it. I didn't see it. It just came in like an idea or a memory. And the name was Max. But then immediately I got Maxine. I thought, oh, maybe it's Maxine or not Max. Anyhow, it's my turn to do, give the talk. And at the end of the talk, I said, uh, now Tina made me promise if I got anything to share it. Now, this is all I got. But I, do the names Max or Maxine mean anything to anyone here? And the pastor of the church, he got wide eyed and he, he said, um, well, Max and Maxine were twins born to the church founder, Florence Becker. And I think we know who is here right now. So now could, could I have done that in another environment when I had that ability? I don't know. But I think being in that environment with that energy of all those people, maybe that propelled that to happen, you know? Um, so that, and then afterward, he said, I want to show you something upstairs that he took me. He said, this is a secret, you know, those two names are secret known to only a couple old board members of the church. No one else knows about that. He took me up, showed me this painting that was done by Florence Becker. He, and it had like a, a landscape with a winding road. And at the end, he says, see those two little figures? That's Max and Maxine. 
So that was pretty crazy. Um, but again, to, to answer you, I, I think the energy that was there had something to do with that, you know. But your medium friend, she knew this all ahead. Yeah. She yep. kept sensing. She didn't know necessarily what it would be, but she knew you would be receiving this. Right. So that's where time doesn't have. Yeah. You know, it's it has. You think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that a couple times with names. It's very interesting, and when you say it to the person, when you find out where the name really comes from, and you stick in your neck out too for someone like me, it's kind of like, yeah, I didn't. She probably knew I would overthink it, and not want to share it. You know because mm -hmm. then yeah. I dismiss it and then you find out it's not only is it specific I mean those aren't common names and you get two names and they're both highly significant to that church you know and so that was pretty remarkable well um uh, uh I just had a guest uh prior to you that just spoke all about um Whitney McNeil spoke all about our spirit guides and spirit and des describing the difference between your spirit guide that's with you all the time or the spirit of a deceased person that you may connect with here and there, which I have one last question and then we'll wind up with your book now because we're okay. getting, but um, uh, I was reading in the book and I was wondering about when, I was, a, I was a little confused whether it was, when you were going to a medium or maybe it was your brother and your uncle. I can't remember, but in an instant, I think your son visited two people at the same time. Is that, I was just, I'm not sure if my question is, can, when we're connecting or contacting or, you know, with a deceased spirit, can that person be with two different people in the same moment at the same time? Or is that- That's, is that you know, that's just a matter of, I can only give my opinion, but I yeah. think so, because I don't think we're bound by kind of the same rules of this linear world we live in. Um, if if you're a pure conscious entity um, and you break the boundaries of time and space, maybe that's not a, a guideline, you know? It, it's interesting too, if you think about it in, in religious terms, think how many people are praying you know, for Jesus intervention in their life or for something, or when they die, they expect to meet Jesus when they pass. How many Jesuses are there, you know? Or, <laughs> or... <laughs> right, right. They must be, because I think you described a couple times, I, I think it might've been one of your son's friends and your son, Stephen. I'm not sure, but they both had a dream or a visit from your son, Brandon, at the same time. Yeah, they... that's right. Um, and it's been a long time, but I, as I recall that account, they, they dreamt, you know, they were asking Brandon what, what it was like. And they, he, they felt this tremendous sense of freedom and to be able to go explore anywhere, you know, instantaneously in that. So I think the message of that was, you know, you're not as limited on the other side as you are here. And one of the other common things, and I saw it physically when my dad was dying, he was reaching up like this to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, like eight hours before he died or, you know, so very within the 24 hour period. And both my mother, my brother and I all saw the same invisible thing. And my brother's a materialist. So for him to say a spiritual thing was beyond, I mean, for me, they'd say, oh yeah, that's Gail. But for him, that was beyond, I mean, I was blown away. And we all said the same thing. Did you see him with the hands reaching up and the hands were reaching down to him of family members? And you hear this continually, which should give some comfort to people in death, knowing that they're transforming to another place, but they're being greeted by their other loved ones that they left in bodily form here. Like yes. your dad met with Brandon, when he was trans, trans transitioning. Right. That, and, some people call that a shared death experience. And Raymond Moody wrote a book called Glimpses of Eternity that have accounts like yours, where other people actually got sucked into somebody's near-death experience and they were like part of it. So for you to see that, to me, almost sounds like a shared death experience. And if, mm -hmm. you know, deathbed visions are very common too, where the dis person who's dying interacts with other loved ones or de deceased loved ones and, and so on. 
I had an interesting situation happen when my sister, Robin, before she passed in 2006, she was in hospice. I went into her room and she was out cold. She was just laying in her bed uh, asleep, I thought, or just, you know, not consciously aware of anything. And I just learned a healing technique um, that was, I guess you call it chakra balancing or whatever, but you'd put your hands over but not touch the person. And so I tried that on her. I went over and I did this process. Her eyes were shut the whole time. She didn't know I was in the room. Then I went and sat down in a chair. And a little while later, she opened up her eyes and she looked at me and she says, they said what you did helped. That's... And then I said, who is they? And then she kind of snapped back into like mortal consciousness and says, oh, oh never mind. <laughs> it's the, I, I, I feel like sometimes I've been a person that is assisted people when they're going to the edge it, where, cause all of a sudden I have some kind of connection. I don't know that they're dying, but somehow I'm with them all of a sudden. Uh -huh. And then I find out later that they had passed but I almost feel like I got like a phone call or something like, could you join me before I go to the edge? And it's nothing. It's it's more of a, a, a feeling. It's not like, you know, like that, but it's a feeling. And I just feel connected and experience what that person is going through in their dying moment physically in, in, in my body. So I, I, you know, I, I, I hope that um, all of this has really brought some comfort to our listeners, knowing that there are other things that death is not the ultimate end and that there's uh, uh, many, many people talking about this so that it's it's not woo-woo, it's not in the closet anymore. And there's it's wonderful just nature. People. Yes. It's nature. And the more stories, which is what our show is about, is healing, sharing healing stories, the more stories we share amongst each other about these things and the more people that learn about this, the more easily they may be approaching their own death in the future that yes. kind of healing. It's a, a wonderful thing. So what I'd like to do now in, you know, winding up our, our talk is if you could share a little bit about your new book that'll be coming out this year that our listeners could to know about, to know about what you've got writing that what's, what's the next thing you have coming out? Yeah, it's called the persistence of the soul. And it basically uh, my second book, the message messages from the afterlife it's that's not out of print. So it's a reissue of that, but it's updated and expanded and re-edited. Um, so it's got new content, more current content in it. And the book is like I talked about early a little bit. It's a mix of personal stories of my experiences with mediums and other types of phenomena like this. It also uh, gets into the science supporting this. Um, it has a chapter about skeptics um, and some of the, the invalid arguments from debunker type skeptics that aren't open to um, any kind of proof or any kind of evidence. Um, it also touches on the religious aspect, you know, for people who have hangups that are tied to their religious background pertaining to these various phenomena. Um, and then there's a couple experiments. I actually conducted an experiment with my sister before she passed, had her uh, write a secret message and put it in an envelope that no one saw until after she had passed. Um, and then um, there was a, a write-up about another experiment that Dr. Ian Stevenson did with the University of Virginia before he passed, and it pertained to a secret code, kind of like the Houdini code thing, but a little bit different, um, pertaining to um, some combination locks where the code would, if the proper code's given, it would unlock these locks that are in Virginia. So it, it's kind of a cross-section of personal experience and um, scholarly stuff, you know, that delves into these various areas, I, I'd say to lend credibility to the experiences. So it's kind of like sharing, here's, here's something that happened that I witnessed and saw um, in detail. Um, and here's science supporting these types of things. That's, it's really, it's, a, it's kind of a unique book that way, because it's not one or the other, it's a blend of those things. I think that's a good idea of, a, of the blending of those. And do Stanley you, endorsed it, so he <laughs> he's what a man. And did you um, yourself actually test your own abilities when in in mediumship for you? Like, did you try? I to haven't. Visit I mean, your sister. It's I have not really. I mean, um, 
a few years ago, I've tried to do random readings for people just to see if I could do it. I found that I could, but I just have never really felt comfortable, I guess, in a way. Part of it is, you know, the writing I do and, and the, the journalistic approach that I try and take. I feel like if I tomorrow said, hey, I'm a medium, I don't know that I would be perceived in the same light of being objective. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's a big responsibility too, you know, especially you're dealing with grieving people. Um, you know, a good reading can really help somebody, but a bad one can set them back. And so I have to get to a point where I'd be feel that I could be good enough to be confident enough where I'm willing to stick my neck out and, and take that risk. because I really don't want to hurt anyone. I, I, I This is why I couldn't, um, I had done only two missing person cases and they they often can have murder or violence possibly surrounding them. And just when I would come upon the, the deceased body and see them, it was very emotional for me, even though it's not my mother or it's not my, this young man grieving over the loss of his missing mother, you know, I, and there's some people like, I guess, it's, you know, like I could never be a doctor. I couldn't cut somebody open. There's certain things that I know is not my comfort level. And um, I wouldn't be capable of doing those kind of things. So I feel that same way also. And I asked my dad about that before he died. I wanted to know, I said, what do I do? Because before my dad was even ever sick, I started crying two years before. And it mm -hmm. turned out that's probably when his cancer started. But since he never saw a doctor for 60 years and didn't believe in using any medical, you know, he was against medical interventions uh there was no way of us knowing that he was having colon cancer that was blocking up all his intestines till he passed out because he couldn't you know pass anything through his body so but before he got to that and he was healthy and going around i would get these images my dad's gonna die my dad's gonna die and i'd have to pull over crying because this so i asked him when we got the diagnosis that he was with cancer and whatever and had a I said, dad, should I have told you when I started feeling those feelings about death? Because I would just be so overwhelmed with this. And what should I have done? And he said, everyone should always experience the death in the way they need to find out about it. It's not for you to tell them that their death is coming. And so it gave me some sort of relief because it does feel like a responsibility sometimes when you know certain things are going to happen and they're not a happy thing. And do you tell them, especially when it's ones where I've met like somebody where I just meet her and I see her husband and I go, oh my God, he's going to die. And two weeks later, he's got some rare heart thing and he dies. I didn't say anything to her. I didn't think it was the right, you know, but I'm just saying from us, us points of view, I, I don't know how to handle that kind of thing correctly because yeah. you don't want to hurt anyone. My dad, his philosophy on that was if he if he felt that he could help them alter that outcome he would share it uh, so so he felt like okay they have cancer but it can be cured but they need to take get it taken he would then tell them but if if he knew that they're they were going to die anyhow he would not mention it that's i think that's the that's very that's the advice i needed to hear there are two levels of knowing if you think it's an accident that that could happen to them get Give them the warning but if you think that there's there's something else that's different then you keep that to yourself yeah and that's a discernment i guess you'd have to see if you feel that you you could get that knowledge of whether it's curable or, or not or could be avoided or not right i i had such compassion for you reading about you asking your son not to go on that hike that day and um, I, th that's always, you know, because th as a parent, parents always go through this where there's a moment they feel their child maybe shouldn't go do this. Something could happen because you're a parent. You don't want them doing something crazy. But yep. then there's another level that's from a very deeper place. Yeah. And your knowingness then was from the very deep place of knowingness. Yeah. Yep. Um, I tried to get him to stop. He was 18 years old and I'm not, I've not harbored any feelings of guilt about it because it would have been manipulative of me to, you know, force him not to go or do something else. You know, it was, I didn't want him to go, but he went, he was old enough to decide what he wanted to do. And also it's all, 
if it's if there is no time, it's already been done. Yeah, right. So it's not it's the wheels are in motion. You know? Wheels are in motion. Well, and I had someone tell me if it hadn't been that day, then it might have happened two days later or three days later. You know, it might have been a harder way to go too. So mm -hmm. uh, it sounded almost in, kind of blissful in a certain way that he seemed very mm -hmm. at peace and in as you said, he was in the most beautiful place that he loved yeah. in a mountain. Yeah. And that yeah, I thought we all have to go sometime. So I guess we'd like to pick how we go if we could. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, so, thanks for having me on, Gail. I really enjoyed it. I don't know if there's any little piece of wisdom you want to share on these sentences or something to leave our guests with. I think just um, that I think life has purpose and meaning and we're here for a reason and don't get too discouraged or down and keep going. Um, enjoy the, the joyful things in life and trudge through the rest. But uh, I think sometimes the world tries to tell us there's, that we live in a chaotic world without meaning. And I don't think that's the case. And I think if you recognize your purpose and look for it in your life to figure out you know, why am I here? And I think we're all here to be re to refine ourselves as souls. So we go through experiences that will refine us and make us better than we were before. So I think um, that's what I would share with folks to, to think of life that way and make the most of it. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to start 2023 with a wonderful thought like that, with all a, a good positive view on life. So I want to thank you very much, Mark Ireland, for joining us today on a small, medium at large podcast. I want to thank all you listeners for tuning in. We want to thank all of our thousand subscribers on YouTube for joining us and have a very, very wonderful, fantastic year ahead. Thanks, everyone. And remember, share your stories because stories can heal. Bye-bye.